Hello, and welcome to Magic is Real, a podcast focused on the fascinating world of near-death experiences, spirit communication, and all things metaphysical and spiritual. The mission of this project is to share messages of hope and inspiration with others, and to spread the word that death is only an illusion. Thank you for being here with an open heart and mind. I wish you peace, light, and love always. Hello and welcome to Magic is Real. I am your host, Shannon Torrance. Today I have with me Jeremy Wyland. And I met Jeremy because he runs a Law of One study group on meetup.com. And he is in my area in Virginia. And I'm going to tell you that what the Law of One is in case you're not familiar with it. Recently or semi-recently, somebody came to me and said, have you heard of the law of one? I think you'd really be interested in it. I didn't know what it was. I looked on meet, meet up and there Jeremy's group was. I thought I'd have him on because while he doesn't claim to be the world's leading expert, he do, he's very knowledgeable about this material. And I'm going to just read a paragraph about what the law of one is so that I don't flub it. The law of one, also known as the raw material, is a series of books that were allegedly channeled by Carla Ruckert, Don Elkins, and Jim McCarty between 1981 and 1984. The entity in which they claim to have channeled refers to itself by name as Ra, and eventually explains that it is not one entity like you might imagine, as you might imagine is how I would have said that, but a concept known as a social memory complex. Jeremy, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate your time. And it's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Uh, Sorry, there haven't been many uh, Law of One meetups lately. Been trying to kind of re-figure out what is the best service to provide right now. And uh, I'm very impatient. So I don't wait long enough to see things take seed sometimes. I need to to do that. But uh, thanks so much for having me on the program. It's great. And also, Jeremy has a podcast called Inaudible. Can you describe... The, the content, I bet, because you'll do it better than I. Oh, yeah, no. sure. Uh, Inaudible is uh, a podcast that is designed to help people like you, me, everybody else on this planet uh, understand better, not perfectly, but better Confederation philosophy or the law of one um, and to apply it to their lives in meaningful ways that allow for them to determine whether the things that some person we don't know told them in a, in a book called the raw material or the uh, raw contact uh, they should be able to validate that for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you said that because I believe that people can channel information, but it's never happened to me personally. And as I've said before, I really believe what I'm a hunt, what I know, is what I've experienced. And so I always take channeling with a grain of salt, not only because, not that I don't think it's a possible thing that can happen. I also don't know that everybody actually is channeling the person they think they're channeling. I'm not even uh, like accusing them of being dishonest, but sometimes we're like, oh yes, I'm channeling and maybe we are just thinking. But I will say, having read a lot of the material, it is, who cares? It is really it aligns with what my near-death experience or friends have shared with with me and with the peop- my audience. It makes so much sense to me. It's so sci- spoken so scientifically that even if this was not channeled by Ra, this group entity, it's brilliant. It's the person who spoke the words would have to be really, really creative to come up with it. So either way, I still love what what it has to say so what do you think about that and know about that about what the law of one is or just or just or or what are your thoughts or yeah what are your thoughts on where it comes from or where this particular work comes from the raw the information that came through in the raw contact came from in my opinion decades of practice and research that the ll research group uh at that time before the raw contact, that would have been uh, Don Elkins and Carla Ruckert. Uh, It came out of decades of research they did into the idea of 
contacting other intelligences via some kind of telepathy or channeling or what have you. Um, there was a real craze for UFOs back in that day. And I think we mm -hmm. still have it. I mean, it's only grown. Um, but what Don Elkins was able to do, like many other people who looked into this side of the UFO phenomena, this weird side, most people are trying to find craft and, you know, see it in the sky and like, you know, go make contact like in a physical sense. But uh, Don Elkins and Carla Ruka talked about making contact in this telepathic sense in a way where if you set the conditions just right and were able to uh, tune your consciousness, you could pick up on other signals. Uh, and so that's their thing, right? They had that experience and we are left with the material. Every Confederation source that I've uh, read has always not only stressed, but insisted on the reader being the uh, authority on what is true and not true for them in that material. Uh, so I think that it's not for me or anybody else to say what the raw material, how it should be regarded or anything like that as a channel material. Um, I actually uh, am part of a channeling circle as well, and, and I practice it, and I can tell cool. you as somebody who puts their heart and soul into it and wants nothing more than to keep my instrument pure so that it can bring through the best information. I'm a bozo on the bus, just like all the rest of us. Like I have flaws. There are blind alleys and blind corners in my consciousness that I don't see. So I rely on the reader to use their discernment so that I don't send them down some, well, it's not me, but I play a part in bringing in the manifestation. So I do have a responsibility. Oh, that's so well said. And I'm a medium, so it's the same. I mean, yeah. that's what I mean. And that's why I can say that with, with assurance that when I give information to my sitter, I always tell them, don't hang on every word I say, because I'm human and I could be wrong. And I'm telling you what I'm seeing, hearing, feeling. Um, you know, if I have a pain in my stomach, that usually means someone has a gastrointestinal disorder in life or past of it, but it also could be that I just ate something bad. So I have to discern between, and it's like the Bible or anything else. I think it's, it's worth reading whether you believe that somebody channeled it from God or whether it was somebody that had these experiences. It doesn't really matter. It's take what you will, take what resonates. Did it help you? Did, yes. And I love that. Who says what's true anyway, right? Like, I'm not trying to be completely Nietzschean about it, but at the end of the day, either you believe it or you don't. And we rarely succeed at tricking ourselves into believing things that we don't actually believe. So just, you know, be honest with, your, with yourself. That's what those of the Confederation and those of Ra would want you to do is to find your own path. Right. And that's why it's stated that this is not any kind of a religion or a dogma yep. it's it's channeled works i would love to know how you jeremy got into this kind of stuff and what's your spiritual background or lack of or whatever it is how did you grow up or what did you grow up thinking believing yeah uh yeah, yeah this is something i've been thinking about lately so good timing uh <laughs> i uh i grew up in a family that was spiritual uh my dad was really into Edgar Cayce. Mm. Uh, he was into the uh, Paul Solomon circle in Virginia Beach, Virginia. If you ever heard of that channel? I haven't. Yeah. Uh, not many people have, but it was really important to him. And he talked about it a lot growing up. Um, so I had these dips into channeling by no fault of my own. My parents were into it. My parents were also in the A Course in Miracles they ran study groups out of their house. So this is all stuff that, you know, there's a lot of things I could say about my parents, but like they got the spiritual stuff 100% right because they did what those of the Confederation and those of Ra suggest, which is you give children resources for finding their own path and you set an example of what sincerity in worship and self-discovery and, and, and all the things that go with uh, a religion or a spiritual path, set an example. Don't tell them to do it. Show them to do it. They should be joining you at meditation. You shouldn't have to like make it a chore, right? So um, they did that really well because I just had all these books around. And so I just started reading. And at first I was really into all of the 
crazy science fiction, like prehistoric stuff and Edgar Casey, crystal weapons and Atlantis and all that. And after a while, uh, reading all of these books, because there's so much material, you start to see what the philosophical strands are without even looking for them. I'm sorry, I'm a little stuffed up. I am too uh, today. And yeah. must be the Virginia I, 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 I feel like I sound horrible. But anyway, yeah, you um, don't. <laughs> uh, so these these threads of, you know, what uh, you could call perennial truth, right? These these insights and these proportions and uh, truths, uh, sayings that come down and seem to find we seem to find them in all sorts of different material that tries to talk about the human condition and the absolute and all these things. Uh, and so it's just what reading all this stuff gave me was the ability to discern. I started to see what was really applicable in my life. And then I had a choice of whether to apply it or not, but that's a different order of information than uh, what your past life was. Mm-hmm. There may be a connection there, but one of them is going to be a lot more directly usable than information about your past life that then you have to fi- you have to deal with the the contradictions that are involved in being two people at once. I mean, yeah. <laughs> let alone that we're everybody at once, like the law of one says. Yeah. So, so, uh, oh, where was I? I got completely off course. Anyway, I'm reading all this stuff. I had an exchange year in Germany where I was an exchange student, lived with a family for a year. I super got in the Course in Miracles during that time. And um, I really think that Course in Miracles was helpful to me on uh, saying the law of one because uh, the diction, the wording, uh, very precise. You know, it comes more from a psychological point of view rather than Ra, which I think those of Ra imbibe some of uh, Don Elkin's engineery talk. But um, yeah, okay, where was I? <laughs> yeah, just talking about your what got you into this. So you're you're doing great. You're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, got in the Course of Miracles. It's super thick. It's a lot of almost I wouldn't say dogma, but doctrine, right? Like yeah. it says it's 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 very prescriptive in what it says you should do. It's like you should think this way. I think that's super cool. And like, I remember telling my uh, philosophy teacher in high school about this book. And I was like, yeah, it's like it brainwashes you, but for a good cause, because it yeah. really does break down how you think. It's very, very unique in that way, I think. I love that you said that. Um, it brainwashes you in the good way. I yeah. say that all the time because I'm a big manifester and I've been thinking about doing manifesting coaching, but I even have some issues with it as it pertains to my idea of free will. And some things are, some things are sort of your soul has chosen and some things aren't in your highest and best good. So um, I take a lot of it with a grain of salt and I'm trying to make it my own because I've seen miracles happen in my life. Um, But it does take an element of delusion. And my feeling is whether you believe in it, that it works because of a spiritual reason or just from putting yourself in the frame of mind to receive positive, to notice the opportunities where where they arise. Either way, it can't hurt you. So I would rather be delusional. It's actually what keeps me completely out of depression and anxiety. It's like, I just keep going, nope, that's just, it's not even denial. It's not, and I don't think it's spiritual bypass because I've done a lot of that deep <laughs> work, but it's, I've done that work for years. And, um, but I do, yeah, there's something to that feeling of, uh, Hey, it can't hurt to get yourself in a positive frame of mind of believing in yourself, having self-esteem, having love, all that stuff can't hurt you. Absolutely not. Um, and like what we're, what we're dancing around here when we're talking about my background comes to the love one is what this metaphysics is in the first place. Like, uh, the course of miracles is very explicit on what their metaphysics is. There is basically only one thing, truth, and everything else is illusion, and that's it. Um, I never found that completely satisfying. It seemed too totalizing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but you know, I wasn't 
you know, this was in college now, this is where I would be now in college. I'm going to course miracle study groups, but I'm like the young kid with all the 60 year olds. So it's not very like satisfying and not something where I really sink my teeth into. Um, and then my dad uh, got in contact with David Wilcock, who was living in Virginia beach. We lived in uh, the Northern neck of Virginia. So about two hours from there. And um uh, he was uh, super into his work and he did do really cool work back then on, uh, he was doing a lot of integrating science from all sorts of different uh, sources, including, uh, this is like late nineties. So we were still going through all of the Soviet science that we never had access to and finding all sorts of crazy stuff. And he was trying to build a common, like a, a synthesized vision to sort of figure out, okay, well, what do we do with all of this? Um, he also claimed to be the reincarnation of Edgar Casey, which piqued my dad's interest. Um, and uh, my dad offered to uh, get me a reading from David from Ra. <laughs> oh. I didn't know anything about Ra at that time, right? Yeah. But uh, I have to say that that reading really woke me up. It, uh, it was aimed right at my heart and it hit at full speed. Uh, I don't know... Now you brought up earlier, like, how do we know this is raw and not something else? Like, look, the, the material was helpful. I find it very hard to believe that raw would come through conscious channeling mm -hmm. um, or anything that didn't require the rigor of the protection that Carla and Don and Jim uh, uh, prosecuted every single time. And like, there's parts in the raw material where they're like, hey, you, when you walk the circle of protection, you, you place your foot wrong. You have to do the whole thing over again. Right. I was actually just researching this last night yeah. and I read the same, read and heard the same thing. Um, and also just reading some of the, the work. Yeah. So that that's, it's, yeah, who knows, but, um, so let's kind of dive into what, I know it's hard to, there's so many little details, but just like, um, as a whole, what is the message of the law of one? Yeah. To wrap up my story, David introduced me to the law of one. Then I found LL Research. Then in 2018 or 2021, I left LL Research to form the working group. So that's my exposure to the law of gotcha. one is meeting Jim and Carla in 2002 oh, and wow. just being okay. completely touched by Carla and uh, trying to spend as much time as I could over there after that. Oh, that's so cool. So you actually so, spent time with them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I, not trained I, by Carla, but I was trained by Jim and the new senior channel uh, after Carla passed, uh, Steve Tybin, who's now part of our working group. That's so interesting. I'll, I'll have more questions about that as well. So yeah, the law of one as a whole, what's the overarching message? Yeah, it's just something that I just wrote up. And so oh, I have it fresh in my mind perfect. because I uh, started going to a Unitarian Universalist church and I wanted to talk to my pastor about it. And I'm like, well, where do I begin on something like this? You yeah. know, you've been chewing on it for 20 years. You get pretty nuanced. And then where do you back up and tell people where to get in, you know? So I would say that the law of one is simply the, the proposition that all things that seem to be separate are actually part of one continuous energy that is the creator, that is ourselves. Everything, all identity is contrived. Everything in reality, in the actual reality, is completely part of oneness, is completely whole and safe and all that, right? So the question is, why do we have lives that do not reflect this uh, premise that I just yes. stated uh, so eloquently? Uh, and the reason is, is because uh, from the law of one, so from the Course in Miracles perspective, uh, you've tricked yourself into believing that sin is real and the illusion is real, and you have to like get yourself out of that thinking. Um, in the law of one, well, this illusion is part of a series of illusions that we evolve through as we modulate and uh, evolve our consciousness little by little over billions and billions of years, supposedly, until we finally get to the point where we can return to oneness, return to the creator. And that aligns with pretty much i can't i mean i'm just going to say everybody i've spoken with who's had a near death experience has said the same thing yeah. it completely aligns so that's why it makes sense to me yeah 
And what are some of the ways, is it, as you were saying, the, uh, it's not like prescriptive. It's not saying like, this is how you have to live. It's yeah. how does it, how is the information presented? I know that's a broad question, but how is it presented and what is it meant to teach us or, and in what, or is there a, um, a specific order and for a specific reason why it's presented the way that it is to your knowledge? Uh, well, to my knowledge, it is an exact, the raw contact is an exact transcript of a dialogue between an entity purporting to call itself raw, claiming to come from a kind of exopolitical organization, although that's really crude, uh, to put it that way, called the Confederation of Planets in service to the one infinite creator. Now, this confederation has popped up through channeling, potentially going back to things like Oapse, right? Oaspe. I never get that right. Um, <laughs> and further back, I mean, there's lots, I, I'm actually trying to put some research together about where we can find how this, you know, so-called UFO channeling thing, how far it goes back and we can find these common roots in like theosophy, in Casey, in, you know, the law of one, in Course of Miracles, maybe, I don't know, like there's probably some strand holding this all together. Um, and I'm interested in that. Yeah, I, and I know what you mean. Um, I, it, it, it almost has lessons. It just, it feels to me like, and I'd love to have you sort of explain a little bit about, they're kind of explaining who they are, at least for where I am in it. They're explaining who they are, what their place in the universe is, what our place in the universe is, and kind of how things work down to they say that they helped build the pyramids, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, rather. Right. Um, so who like i know you kind of described it but who are they where do they come from and what's right. their interest in us yeah so there needs to be kind of a metaphysical primer to to be able to sort of like show you a map of where we are and where they're from and why it's significant they're there and we're here right um, yeah that's good yeah so and 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 all that i'm going to explain are basically these distortions these progressive distortions that issue from the idea that separation is real and this illusion is in progress where we pretend that we could possibly be anything but the creator mm -hmm. so all of this evolution that's going on is part of this big illusion that is a kind of thought experiment the creator in my opinion it's a thought experiment the creator is kind of like working out in its head about what if I did this, you know, what yeah. if, what if evil was real? I, I mean, that's really crude. That's not how I think it works, but like, uh, there, there's some sort of creativity going on. That's about the very concepts of existence, I think. And, uh, so man, I feel, I feel like I keep getting off topic. This is so big to handle. No, this, this makes, I know that's, you're doing great. Cause I, I'm, I'm following. I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> no, you're, it sounds, it, I, 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 so who's raw? That's what I was, let's yeah. I was getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in this vast creation that has all these, not just illusion, but different illusions, different, what you might understand as bands of consciousness in which we are tuned, right? Um, there are beings that are at higher levels and lower levels. You can find that in Buddhism, you know, the Vedic scriptures, you know, theosophy. Uh, yeah. Um, those of Ra claim to come from the sixth density. And what they say is that uh, reality, the illusion, is fractal. And so it's constantly breaking itself into these pieces of seven. So there's seven sub densities in our octave of creation. An octave is eight, right? So you have, you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then the eighth octave, or sorry, the eighth uh, density of this octave is the first density of the next octave. Just like you go from C to C. Yeah. Once you go to C up there, it's part of a new octave. So um, they are, uh, two levels away from the octave, right? We're uh, five. <laughs> okay, and yeah. so um, we're in third density. Third density is a density where we're learning the lessons of love and how to choose a polarized manner, a, a, an empowered and concentrated, uh, energized manner of expressing this love. Um, Ra sees their 
role in sixth density where they're learning completely different lessons because they learned our lessons billions of years ago or millions, I should say. Um, Ra is trying to help us. Uh, they have very strict rules in the Confederation about interfering because they place primary importance on free will. Uh, in the law of one cosmogony, free will is the end all be all. It comes even before love in my, in my, in my reading of it uh, because it is just such a creative aspect of a, something like the creator creating something like this creation. Um, it is what we are imbued with that allows us to be creative agents. Mm. And uh, I believe that consciousness in general is like not just thinking. It's this uh, switching mechanism or this uh, 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 routing mechanism that we interact with other densities of consciousness through. So channeling, bringing higher density information to lower density, is just a feature of consciousness. It's not a special thing. We do it all the time. You know, uh, the only thing that we do in the in the channeling circle is we tune, and we have certain protocols we've worked on for a long time that give us confidence that we're bringing through a certain caliber of information from a certain source. But uh, I think that we all pick up on things all the time, like. You know, those of those of the confederations say that mind is like a big pool. So we're all wondering, you know, can they read our thoughts and all that? And like from their point of view, they just see this big pool, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we can see it, but we don't care, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine, uh, now a friend, she was on the podcast, Lily Nova. She is a um UFO experience her but she's a this is what she does now like this is her whole thing she is an astrophotographer and she was never even into it didn't know anything about it and suddenly as she was taking pictures of the sky she yeah. started to see craft and then started to get messages and now she fully has this relationship and she said look sometimes they come to me while on their while I'm on the toilet they don't care like that's not they're not concerned with that but she's like sometimes I'll be like could you please <laughs> you know because she said I'll be walking around my house and there they are yeah, that's uh, that was also uh, Mark Probert, uh, a channel from the '50s, who was uh, uh, very foundational in the Confederation uh, pantheon of of uh, channelers and and researchers and some kooks out there, right? There's some yeah. there's some fraudsters out there, but um, he had that experience with his uh, clear audience and clairvoyance, where he would just start getting messages on the train. He'd be like, "Hey, can we do this later?" Yeah, and they always complied. Yeah, they will. That's that's the nice thing. Yeah. That is so interesting. And and like I said, makes so much sense. What's our role in all of this? How do we get here? Are, are we living in a matrix? Is it all a simulation? Are we are are we like little dolls that, you know, like aliens or I know we have free will, so I know that's not true, but just generally, what would you yeah. say when people ask you that kind of thing? Yeah. We do have free will. Uh, but the question is, who is this we we're talking about, right? Uh -huh. This is this is what I meant when I said that one of the foundational premises of everything being one is that identity is arbitrary, right? Yeah. Like divisions between this consciousness and that consciousness, this person, that person, they're all made up. They serve a purpose, which mm -hmm. is that in an illusion where we are trying to teach the creator something it doesn't know about itself already through this entire creation of the octave where it's thrown itself in small pieces into the void. And then in billions, trillions, I don't know how long, brings it back in through a long, slow process of evolution where it's learning about itself and teaching its thing, itself things that you can only see when you're looking really, really closely at one point of the infinity of everything. That allows you to have a focus. And that's what they say uh, our levels of reality are. They're these focuses of energy and love. And um, what that doesn't really matter to us, except that it is a good model. The same model applies to our consciousness. What we think about and what we put our, what our desire drives us towards, these are all things that are going on within us. And we have some conscious participation in them, but they're not all happening at a conscious level. There's mm -hmm. lots of stuff going on behind the scenes. We may dream about it. We may have inklings about it. It may be completely occluded to us. Um, 
what I think the Confederation's main message is, is, you know, to love, but specifically uh, to tune your interest, instrument, to work on yourself, to start understanding how little, <laughs> how little you participate in your fuller self because you don't have a relationship with it. What they suggest for forming a relationship with yourself, with your full self, not just the self that's waking consciousness in this third density. That's just a small, tiny, infinitesimal part of you. It's serving a very good purpose with its ego and everything. It gives you a personality, gives you an avatar in the game, right? So that yeah. you can learn lessons, so that uh, you can have things at stake that seem to matter. It's an illusion, but it's, it's didactic. It's, it's, it's educational. It's designed to teach you, not you who's the, the person here. You may get stuff out of it, but you are real. your personality is kind of an instrument for your greater self. That sounds scary until you realize it's all you. Yeah. So it's just, there are parts of yourself we already know, Freud told us, that are hidden from us. So the idea is, since we can't access them directly, can we learn by sitting with ourselves in silence and understanding our hardware better? Understanding our thoughts, noticing our thoughts, noticing how patterns of thought exist and how when we put energy into this thing, somehow it, 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 it gets our attention, but not this thing, you know, just little things that only you can know about yourself. Meditation is the one real commandment that they give. If, That's if what they I was just going to ask you about. Yeah. yeah. Meditation introduces you to yourself on your terms, not on the world's terms, because the world's going to show you all sorts of reflections and they're all valuable, but, and they're all you, but there's also an undistorted uh, source within yourself, I believe. And I believe the Confederation talks about this. They can't prove it to you. You have to find it yourself. But once you find it, you can't forget about it. And that's the wonderful thing about the spiritual path is that once you really <laughs> discover how magic everything is, uh, you can, you can go back to normal life and try, but eventually you're going to start thinking about it. And this is what the Confederation wanted to do. This is what they claim. I don't know if it's true or not, but they claim that the UFO flaps and all of the visitations from the positive uh, you know, uh, Confederation of Planets in service of the One Infinite Creator, all of this is designed with one goal, to introduce people to mystery, to pique their curiosity about the nature of existence. Something's not right here. I think we all got that vibe from the Matrix movie that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. That vibe where he's just like, something's just not right here. We've all had that. And like, it's a real feeling, but like the point isn't to like uh, fix everything. The point is to feel what we have gone to great trouble to place in front of ourselves, which is a very troubling but educational illusion that shows us parts of the creator that seem very, very distorted, very ugly, um, and very twisted. But at the end of the day, they're all us, and they are all acting out of their understanding of love. So uh, there's lots of different techniques that those of Ra talk about in terms of thinking about the scenario, uh, how to serve people, right? Um, uh, you know, how to work on your dreams or whatever it is. But I think that core thing that I just said is key, that it's really about looking within yourself, making yourself uh, able to serve. Because a lot of what they say, uh, uh, just tuned living is about, is serving. Mm -hmm. It's giving things away. Because you give away, you pull it in. And so the idea is that channeling, I think, is something that is endemic in consciousness. It's not a special thing fancy people like me do. It is a normal thing that we all do. And I think Jesus's message at the end of the day, if you had to put it in like a really bullet point form, is empty yourself out so that the creator can come through you and do these things that I do and you'll do greater because it will be your service it will be your situation where you are the unique creative person you're not just smart you don't just have intelligence you also have intuition you also have heart you have lots of things you're a social uh, uh rock calls us mind body spirit complexes we are complexes of three elements that all come 
come to bear in every moment of our lives. And we're trying to balance that. We have seven different ways of, of thinking. The chakras, these yeah. energy prisms that refine the energy coming from the feet and from the one infinite creator up through us. And we distort it. And we're learning how to not distort it so it's pure coming through. And one of the most beautiful images that those of Ra have are that um, you're trying to... Um, it's not your light that you want to share with people. It's the creator's light. You just need to like clean up the window pane that's coming through, get rid of the smudges, you know, like you, and that's slow, tough work. Nobody is saying that this happens overnight. There's not some big aha moment. It's always possible, but it's not likely. So I, I guess I grew up <laughs> when I finally realized that I had to start meditating. Right. And Everything else flew, flowed from that. If there's one piece of advice I'd have to give anybody, just meditate. How? Don't care. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you if you have like a, if you're more of a silent meditator or guided meditation person or what works for you. Um, I really like the sort of insight meditation, the kind of, uh, well, what I, what I really work on in meditation, and this is just me, I am not yeah. prescribing this to anybody. Uh, I think it's really useful actually to have a lot of different types of meditation and find yeah. out what you like. Uh, but I really like get to that point where the mind is still. Mm -hmm. And I get it for about a fraction of a millisecond every time I meditate. Yeah. And I spend the rest of my time getting there. Me you too. know, I, <laughs> good. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, it, to me, meditation is like the gym, right? You're working really hard on something that's hard, but you're building strength over time. And mm -hmm. the point of meditating is, as Pima Chodron said, one of my favorite oh, authors, yeah, Pima Chodron, mine too. she says, the point of meditating is not to become great meditators. The point of meditating is to have enough discipline and uh, knowledge of yourself, feeling for yourself, familiarity with yourself and your flaws, your good, your bad, that uh, you can bring that meditative, peaceful state into waking life. And then you can radiate that to other people. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really well said. And that's why I actually like guided meditations myself, because it does help me to get out of my own head, just to focus on somebody else's voice yeah. or other sounds. I can get there much, much more easily. And I'm very interested in the topic too of polarity. Yes. So talk, you can just riff on that, whatever you want to say about it. Uh, I'm going to give you my version. Yeah, because it's kind of all integrated into my approach. And if I'm wrong, I'll be the first to admit it. But I think it works. It's uh, basically when we're in third density, we have this idea of that there's power in our actions in an ethical sense. We can bring uh, people happiness and peace and joy through our actions. We can also create lots of distress for them. Uh, and there's morals and uh, like uh, parables and stories that we all learned growing up about good and evil, right? You should do good things and you should not do evil things. If you do good things, you're good. If you do evil things, you're bad. Well, um, my understanding is that this is a crude uh, sort of culturally inflected reflection of the primary reason that we're in third density and we have a separation between our full self in our waking conscious. That is not a mistake. It's not a flaw in our design. It is, per it is a purposeful handicap that we have given ourselves so that we have to pay attention in the moment and find the love there. And we can only do that if we exercise faith, blind faith, without knowing that everything is, is, is all united. Our, our greater self knows that all of this is an illusion and that there's not really any risk, but the illusion is here so that we don't know that everything's connected. Everybody seems like they hate us. Everybody seems like they're against us. The world seems like it's falling apart. Uh, people are defrauding each other, you know, left and right, you know, uh, nobody trusts each other. Uh, and yes, this is a very, very difficult place to find love, but if it didn't have love, it wouldn't exist. So the issue is, I think, uh, tracing that love back to its source so we can correct mistakes. We can, we can do things differently. 
And I believe that when we are doing this kind of investigation of ourselves, we are we are availing ourselves of a power slowly that we have as co-creators, as the creator, right? We all have ultimate power, but we have blocks protecting us from it, uh, especially in this density, because it's really useful to have an ego. It's your vehicle in the social world. Um, it's not a bad thing, but it's not something I would, you know, I wouldn't want to have a drink with my ego, but whatever. <laughs> Any, anyway, uh, so what I believe we're doing in this moral space where there's lots of paradoxes, things don't always line up. We are working on an energetic level behind the scenes on how we will express our creative, destructive, all-encompassing, powerful love. Will we radiate it, give it away, and by giving it away, we become vessels that channel that love to others and we give it freely and we give it with no strings attached and we want everybody to be freed by this love. And so the actions we do in life, that nobody sees the love, right? But the actions are better or worse reflections in the third density uh, uh, matrix of what that broader concept is in what Ra calls intelligent infinity, the plenum of everything, all potential. Um, that's part of our unity with everything. And um, when we act from the heart altruistically, as if our brothers and our sisters are ourselves, what I believe we're doing is we are, we are doubling down and, and expressing our belief, our rigid faith that this is the way that the creator should be. And this is the way that I'm going to pursue the creator. As we do that, somehow, mysteriously, uh, Jim McCarty thinks it has to do with how many thoughts you have, 51% thoughts, service to others or positive or radiative um, versus 49% service to self. Service to self would correspond to evil, but it's not the same thing. It is a valid path to the creator that instead of radiating, collapses. It brings everything into itself and sees everything outside the self as to be controlled. Sometimes for everybody's good, but controlled. So it's a, it's a distinction between giving somebody love and letting them do with it what they will. And that's what they call healing a lot of time. Healing is the love that's given. And it's a better healing if it's a pure love where the higher self of the person you're healing will know what to do with that energy. They'll know what to do with it. They just need more. And uh, you can give that quite freely. Um, but there's a whole philosophy. There's a whole way of understanding the creator that tries to pretend that you are the creator and tries to bring the entire creation into your domain. And uh, it is a path that uh, goes through, you know, both positive and negative, go through fourth density, fifth density, sixth density. And in sixth density, those of Ra tell us that at that level, um, a service to, service to self entity, a negative entity, uh, for, they are not aware that any entity has gone negative beyond sixth density. Every single sixth density entity who's negative at some point uh, realizes they can't go any farther. And so they make a spontaneous reorientation of their, uh, of their uh, polarity to now understand the creator in this entirely different way. And you would think that as you move down a path of polarity more and more, that would be more, uh, 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 it would be more concrete, right? It would, it would be harder to change as you, as you increase your polarity and you double down on more of your energy going out than going in so that more, you know, um, but actually what those of Ross say is that the farther down the path of service to others or service to self you go, the more opportunities you give yourself to do the spontaneous switch. Like basically what, you know, Christians call like the test of life, right? Like life will, you, okay, you learned something, well, now life will test you. We call that a uh, catalyst in our system. And so catalyst is designed uh, first and foremost, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a feature of the fact that you have a subjective experience that's cut off from the direct contact with other subjective experiences. So Whatever you experience in your life, when it comes at you first and you have to like process it, uh, it's going to have that unique thing that you that calls it out to you. We all have tons of things happen to us every day that we don't even pay attention to. But there are certain things that grab our goat, that, that push our button. 
that's catalyst. It's a little kink in the energy system. And it's designed to show us something about ourselves. So we can design, we can decide whether we want to accentuate that distortion, which we sometimes do, or balance it. And so, uh, man, I've covered a lot of ground here. I hope it all You've makes done sense. Amazing. No, you, <clears throat> this throat thing today. You, I was just thinking, this is so good. I'm so glad that uh, this is why I had you on because you do have such a very clear, eloquent, articulate way of explaining this very dense material. Yeah. And it really makes complete sense. And I'm sure it does to my audience as well. The idea of polarity would be to simplify it too. I mean, to really, really simplify it is sort of like without the dark, there is no light. There's nothing to compare it to. And that's right. So that's- yes. I'm giving double thumbs up to Shannon. Oh, thank you. Because that's kind of, <laughs> that's just my, how my brain works. It's like, you know, we need, we need the dark to illuminate built to see the light, to really appreciate the light, to understand if there was no darkness, then we, if we were just always in light, what would we really learn? What would we, we're just not here to, we're not just here to sort of cruise down, you know, cruise down the river. That's an interesting uh, point that you bring up because those of Ra, when they are explaining why our experience works this way, why our lives work this way, and they start getting into the archetypal mind, which is a very, very deep facet of mind that patterns uh, the plan of evolution or the plan of consciousness for like an entire like galaxy or solar system. I'm not quite sure. They, they mess around with those terms a little bit. Ra is, not a, Ra, Ra is very precise, but they get numbers wrong all the time and they admit it. They get, uh, if you ask them transient details, right? Like, oh, who's going to win the lottery? Or like, you know, they're like, well, we can give you an answer, but like, it's distorted by the very fact that it's transient because all the calculations they're doing in their dimension, like it just, it's hard. Love comes through pretty clear. Everything else is kind of eh, hit or miss. In any case, uh, crap. What was I talking about? Um, pol- I am uh, way the out li- of it. I had a no- birthday yesterday and it was a lot of fun and I'm still recovering. You're doing great. Like I said, <laughs> that five times. Um, no, I really appreciate it. The, no, you were saying it just, you were sort of just riffing on the fact that without the dark, there is no light. I mean, it, that's, yes. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I need your... to stop digressing. It happens on the podcast that I record and it's good, but here it's not working for me. It, it's working <laughs> for me. So don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah. And it's okay if that's there kind of was what you a creation, say. there are creations, there are octaves before our octave. Yeah. Those are different creations with a whole different patterned plan of evolution and consciousness. And we, when I say before, I'm not really talking about time because this is all outside of time, but let's not get down to the bog in the details. Um, in earlier creations, I'll just sum it up. In earlier creations, they said that they had designed it so that there was no veil and that mm. people like you and me in, ex- in an illusion like this would have access to their full selves. And they said that it took third density. Third density usually is supposed to be complete in 75,000 years. Uh, And they said that they would just stick in third density and never get out of it because they had no drive. They had no, there was nothing pushing them. Like if you know, everything is great, you're not going to invest too deeply in anything that you do in your life. It's really strange. And I think it, it's very, uh, uh, it recalls that part of the matrix where they said, I think it wasn't the architect, but it was like agent, whatever. And he was like, oh, we tried to create a a love and happiness matrix where everybody would be happy and everybody rejected it. I think the, uh, what's going on there uh, in our story in real life is that uh, we need some sort of motivation to apply ourselves to these very, very difficult lessons about love because they are scary. It is easier to just block them out, not think about them, uh, to see them on the news, uh, to just see them as our neighbor that we don't like. Uh, all of these things that occur in our lives that disturb us, that throw us, throw us off our center. Like that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us that we feel that way. You know, Pima Chodron says that, you know, it, something uh, touches a sea anemone in the water and it closes up because all things react that way to the unknown. All things have, Mm. fear is a natural uh, uh, aspect of consciousness when the unknown is too unknown. 
And so we are learning how to have faith in spite of that not knowing and build it to a magical level so sufficient that we can bust through to the next density. And uh, I, I mean, I don't think you really bust through. I think it's actually a graduation process and there's lots of help for us always. But um, the idea is that I think we need to use what we consider to be the ethical and moral lessons, those matters of the heart that are behind a lot of the things that, that bother us or we think a lot about or that we struggle with. Um, it's important that we struggle with it. It's important that we think about it and that we figure out what it is that we truly desire and let that ignite our service. Um, the Confederation says that desire is like the motivating force of evolution throughout the entirety of the creation. Everything is pushed by desire. The law of attraction people, they have it right. It's just that doing it about money is kind of lame, but in my opinion, but yes, what we desire, we attract to us. We desire, and like, here's the thing. There are parts of us that we're not aware of that are also desiring. So that's why sometimes we bring things to us, experiences, uh, lessons to us that we wouldn't consciously choose. In fact, uh, those of Ross say that we uh, program our whole uh, uh, lifetime with catalysts. Uh, they, I don't think it's like a like rigid plan, but the biases are there, right? Yeah, I was. I would love to know just a tiny bit more about the law of attraction according to Ra. Uh, well, Ra never, I don't think Ra ever mentions it other than that attraction is kind of a basic force of the universe. Yeah. Like it's the basic integrating, unifying force of the universe. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think it's just a matter of recognizing how powerful we are as conscious beings. Yeah. You know, in third density, this is the first density that we have self-awareness, self-consciousness. First density is more of the mineral world. That's where everything starts out. And it's very easy to be at one when you're just a rock uh, and you're just waiting billions and billions of years to evolve to the next step, which is our plant and animal life. Uh, and that has consciousness, but not self-awareness, right? It's pack mentality. You and the pack don't really have a meaningful difference between each other. Uh, it's about survival. It's about uh, a brute struggle in a lot of cases. And that struggle that we come from when we finally learn self-awareness, uh, that is a tough, <laughs> that is a tough liminal state to uh, transcend. And uh, self-consciousness is hard. It means that we have this reflective capability. So now we know how now we know that our ass is hanging out, right? Like now we can see ourselves. We see ourselves in each other individual because we have this individualness to us. And uh, that is a very important tool in our evolution, apparently. By being individuals that seem to be cut off from everybody, we have to make moral and ethical and spiritual uh, choices on faith alone. Because for all we know, it's a dog eat dog world out there. I realize that it's just about in my view, uh, living your life as a creative act, understanding that the things you believe in are expressed through your actions and that the most powerful form of communication is setting an example. Showing somebody something that's possible, not talking about it. Like that's my, this is all, this is all Jeremy stuff. But like, I think uh, in this space, uh, people one of the big things that I really took away from the Confederation philosophy is that you have to do. And there's something very, very, very fundamental about action in the world. It's not everything, but it does really, it's where the rubber meets the road. And there's something very, very powerful about our material, dense, depressing illusion, uh, but also a beautiful illusion, right? Mm -hmm. Like also a beautiful illusion, but it's very, very, uh, it, it kind of hems us in, it feels like a lot of times. Like we feel we're spirits. I think we all naturally feel, we all naturally in the back of our recesses remember a time where we had more. We had, we, we were just more. We shouldn't have to settle for all this. And that's a, that's a completely valid feeling. We shouldn't have to settle for all this. Um, and we just need to remember, I would suggest to the listener, I, we, would, we would be uh, maybe consider that it could all be a huge mistake 
and the world's going down the toilet and this is because we all screwed up and oh well turn the lights off last one out <laughs> or we could see that there's we could look within and see whether or not we believe that there is something more going on here and that the looks that we give each other on the street when we have a moment of loving consciousness that we share uh the moments that the creator gives you to help another and then show them that somebody cares when they didn't think anybody cared like all these little vignettes this is so much more important than ufo stuff and like conspiracy theories and all that you can believe in all that stuff but i this is why i'm uh, really interested in a group of people who have made a conscious effort to bring this consciousness, this way of looking at the world. It's just a perspective, right? But this perspective, bring it into the world, living their lives and sharing with other people who are applying it to their lives, the feedback. So we can all kind of like support each other. We don't know how all of this works. We're learning it like everybody else, but the teacher that will work best is actually applying it and seeing if it works in our lives or not. Not believing in blind faith in like an idea that somebody discarnate or incarnate said that's we should we should know by now that that's not the way forward <laughs> oh i love that uh i know that this is something that could be delved into for hours and hours and hours yeah but in the interest of brevity and uh our time i just want to thank you so much for bringing so much wisdom and experience to this discussion i found i'm fascinated by it and i know that this is going to be well received oh, and appreciated man. there's so much that that we could talk about endlessly, but I really feel like you summed it up really well. I guess I'll oh, just I kind feel of... like I just threw the cards at you that's, and made you that's pick all them we up. need. Like, I'm really that's... sorry. No, that's I... all we need because the thing is <laughs> this is good practice for me though. Right. There's so much in there that you could really take any little piece of it and that's why you have a meetup group. Right. Yeah. I mean you can dissect it just the way that people have Bible study. I mean it's it's not just one thing. It's a yeah. whole it's a whole thing. And so thank you for really making it digestible um, for, for me and for a lot of other people. I, I look forward to the next meetup because I really would like to, to continue to learn more. Yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to make that happen somehow. I just need to figure out how to fit it into my life. I in understand. A way, in a way where I feel like I'm actually giving you something that's worth your time. You know what I mean? Like exactly. I can just show up and answer questions, but like after a while that gets kind of boring for everybody. Uh, it'd be right. nice to have some focus. And I think yeah. people deserve that. Yeah. And if well, I can't then, provide it, then yeah, yeah, then then don't worry about it. I mean, yeah. Just, yeah. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say in general about um, about this about this topic? I mean, in general, what do you want people to know? What have you learned? How has this been incorporated into your life? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is a daily meditation practice. I would strongly, strongly, strongly. I don't have any control over you, brothers and sisters, but <laughs> if I could. I would ask you to do one thing and meditate. I don't care how, I don't care when, I don't care how long, and nobody else does either. The point is, is that uh, in the same way that desire brings things to us, setting an intention is powerful too. And just the intention for 30 seconds to try to pay attention to yourself matters. And, it's, and, it, and it puts grooves in your energy body. And it really sets things in motion. Remember, you're not paying attention to the whole scene. You don't know what's going on uh, in all the parts of yourself. Uh, you're largely a mystery to yourself, but you can be less of a mystery and more of a, and you can, what, what, what I think a real magician does is they become friends with the uh, subconscious and hidden parts of themselves. And then through cooperation, not through command, but through cooperation and building a relationship over time, you can act as a unit. I Frankly, I think that. that's what we're going to do on this planet altogether, too. We're going to finally figure out that we can't command each other around. We can't push each other around. We just got to pull together. And it will happen one day, I believe. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> well, and thank if not, you we get another chance. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jeremy Weiland, for being here and for sharing your knowledge about the law of one, the raw material. Mm -hmm.